you a perspective from public education in our secondary schools? My charge today was to come in and bring this back to the classroom. And I think we've all felt a little bit that the pressures of the Common Core, NJ Achieve, all that hitting at the same time, I've heard it over and over again, has shoved us into a box. Everybody's looking at their lessons going, now I have to throw out this and push in that. We need an evangelist. You saw, perhaps, I wasn't going to take too much time for it, Common Core just healed the infirm. I came up in a walking boot and now I'm in a shoe, partly so I can walk around like this. And my goal today, if you walk out of here without one activity to pull into your classroom, feel free to punch me in the face. I gotta get you on my side because a lot of you guys were expecting the Fresh Prince to come up here, right? You look, you see, you know, Will Smith's coming to talk, this is great! And it's just not what you were expecting. So let's... There's a purpose to this. We are in this boat together. I know that the majority of you guys in here are tied to language arts in some capacity. But the way the Common Core has shifted our thinking, we're all tied to language arts. And I know every teacher who's not an English teacher is saying, that's the English teacher's job, and I know you can tell me all you want. I need to teach reading stuff in my classroom. But that's not for me. Literacy and content literacy is the absolute bottom line, core college skill, life skill that we can move them forward with, students move forward with. So as we go forward, I know you've heard these things. These are ripped out of major education publications. Good and great teachers are replaced by new and cheap workers more willing to follow factory foolproof lesson plans that are prescribed. Oh yes, Common Core is doing that. Academic creativity has been drained and degraded from overworked and experienced teachers. Uniformity has sucked the life out of our classrooms, our teaching and learning. Many publishers are coming in. They're going to save the day, right? They're just going to, oh, it's all Common Core line. Buy it. Purchase it. The Common Core is huge. It's a dramatic shift. I am here, and if I were in front of you in Texas, I might say, can I have an amen? To tell you that, to tell you that this is not a call for difference. It's a call for us to draw upon our creativity and tie it to what we already know how to do. The Common Core, in my opinion, has given us, come on, click now, has given us much more freedom to go forward. I was in a Wegmans over the summer before this school year started and overheard two teachers talking, I came to find out. And they seem to be maybe middle school, elementary school, and I just heard the woman saying, oh, this Common Core stuff, this, that, and other. Now I can't do any of the projects that I wanted to do. My kids are going to hate this year. I rolled into my own students back to school night, and a teacher stood in front of a group of parents and said, well, since the Common Core has arrived, money's going to stop at the end of first grade, and then they'll get it again in fifth grade. Now we don't teach money, sequentially money, and the understanding of how dollars work. Just, we just abandon it, because Common Core has come along. I'm telling you, and my goal today, is to convince you that that is patently false. That we actually have more doors, more access, to creative, exciting assignments that will keep our kids college and career ready, but also keep us in line with what the Common Core expectations are. I hear it. I can't do projects. Common Core is limiting. I have to abandon what I usually do. There's no room for creativity. And my personal favorite, throw out every item of fiction you have in your curriculum and replace it with those 500-page non-fiction books because the kids who don't read would certainly read that. Take out, yeah, right, you know? Take out the Scarlet Letter and put the Encyclopedia Britannica in front of them. They're going to read it. Oh, it's all good. And it's non-fiction. Just because it's called the tipping point, they're going to read it more than they would read the lovely bones. Not sure. Not sure. Okay. Let's just get a mental check here. This is from one of Tracy Severin's earlier presentations. Not today, but on another time. This is all we're talking about for Common Core Expectations. It's a pretty simple layout. Our kids need to be able to read literature. They need to be able to read informational text. They need to be able to understand the vocabulary in said works. They need to be able to write a little bit. And when all is said and done, they need to formulate a case. And I think all of us who are college educated would say that's kind of the kill. If you can put skill information together, make a point, you are college ready. 
That's all you need. I've seen something. I like that line from that. I like that line from that. I'm going to make a case. And if you're an English major, you're totally making it up. You're going to make a case and go forward. And then maybe go to law school. And by the way, please don't. Oh, come on. That was just informational text. If you knew how to read that diagram, you just did informational text. So when your science teachers and your math teachers come to you and say, Whoa, 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 we're not teachers of reading. Slow down, buddy. Just teach the graph. Teach how that chart goes. Your eyes went across, they went down, you understood it was a flow chart, you moved forward. Lesson done. Took three minutes. They're teachers of English. Bravo. Nobody had to stop and say, how many syllables? What's the, phon you know, the phonetic awareness there? How does this go? Don't worry about it. It's there. They know how to do it by virtue of being experts in their content areas. Let's examine a little more. English language common core is broken down to these. This is my hit list. Okay? We need to know how to close read. We need to be able to think higher order, which... Bloom's pushing us that way anyway, we know that. We need to build content vocabulary, a huge gap right now, in my experience. We need to integrate multimedia into our presentations. Okay, our kids are really coming in a good place on that, currently. We need to be able to argue through our writing. We need to pre provide evidence in our writing. And we need to be able to compare two things that look at a similar topic and look at them differently. That's it. I would guarantee that the curricula that you had two years ago, and I'm hoping your district didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater and totally start from scratch. But the curricula you had in place two years ago probably hit all these pieces with, as Ms. Severance talked about, very strong lesson design. Okay, let's start with close reading. All grade levels, all subject areas need to develop this skill. Common Core calls on it. Okay, and I know I have some science teachers in here. I think I have some music teachers. I have some math teachers. I looked at the sign-up list, but we need to work on close reading. But I'm no reading teacher. All right, fair. Check the pulse. You can be a health teacher. It's all good. This will work. What does close reading look like in its simplest form? I would advocate that we take shorter and shorter passages. I've been an English teacher for 20 years. I know that the students come in less and less prepared for what I've asked them to read. Our job in that 50 minutes, that 40 minutes, that hour and a half, whatever your classroom time span is, is to get those students engaged with a certain degree of text. I would argue that you could take a paragraph, and with that paragraph, by teaching the hell out of it, you could give them every skill they need to walk into college. We can sit here, we can debate, we can go to our live binder sessions and talk about why there's a canonical set of literature that we want for our students to, to move forward with so we as a culture can say, don't you know when we're talking about a scarlet letter? What, what, or what's happening here? Or if we say Abigail Williams, we might know bad news is ahead. Or, or uh, you know, if we talk about Willie Loman, we kind of know there was kind of a sad end to that. Yeah, we can make that case and we want to know, you know, to be or not to be what Shakespeare play that comes from. However, kids don't arrive at those works. Take the smaller pieces, read, reread, break it down, scrutinize vocabulary and syntax. Why is Hemingway different from Faulkner? Can our kids, when they graduate in 12th grade, can they understand why someone would choose short, simple, choppy, staccato-like sentences versus languid, twisted, convoluted sentences. And why, when I'm targeting a certain audience, or trying to make a political statement, or trying to make some sort of artistic statement, why I would choose one over the other? If you open Finnegan's Wake and you're looking for the end of the sentence and you're going 30 pages in, what is going on here, right? They need to be able to identify tone. I'll never forget my AP English students who came back after the exam and we reviewed the question, you know, they're never supposed to tell you anything. I hope no one's here from the college board. They came out and they said, oh, we had this great British piece. Ah, it's probably from like the 1600s or something like that. We pulled it up online. And the room was evenly split. Some kids took it word for word. Oh, that's what he was saying. Sure. The other guys missed the fact that it was a sarcastic, almost like a... Um, you know, burn the babies, we're going to cook them for our food because we're starving, modest proposal kind of statement. They missed the sarcasm of it because they didn't know how to read for tone. Lesson to Smith, going back to class the next year. Got to work on tone more. 
We need to determine why an editorial works as an editorial, a poem works as a poem, an instructional manual works as an instructional manual. And we need to be able to identify bias. When someone's got a dog in the fight, how are they trying to persuade us? How do they hide evidence from us? Best example of that is to use modern media. We know what the political breakdowns are of our major news, cable news broadcasts right now. Put one story up, cover it one way, one way. I mean, every night on the news is a research paper. Every story is a research paper. Right? The anchor gets up at the desk. They say, here's the little lead into it. Let's go to the field and hear from this reporter. They put it back. There it is. That's Common Core. You could watch the news in your class and be done with informational text and getting your kids college and career ready. Obviously, it's not as simple as that. But how many people are watching the news in any of their classes? How many people in the science rooms are turning on not the Discovery Channel version of global warming, but rather CNN's version, and then throw up Fox News' version right next to it, and say, kids, what's going on here? How did they present those two stories? Why? What are they trying to do? What information did they use? Is there a bias? What kind of facts and figures did they put up? Guess what? We go back to that slide about what the Common Core asks every single thing. And I know you may say that sounds a little like 10th, 11th, 12th grade in high school. That can be 5th, 6th, 7th grade. That can be 4th grade. We need to examine texts of various lengths from a variety of sources. The most simple, we look at first paragraphs. I would love, because you can do these things in college, right? Teach an entire class of just first paragraphs of novels. The amount of information conveyed in the beginning of Huckleberry Finn in that first paragraph is unbelievable. The amount of information in this first paragraph from The Lovely Bones is unbelievable. My name was, all right, she's dead, salmon, like the fish. How's she talking about herself? I was murdered. There's a piece of information I need. 1973, let's get some cultural context. What's a mission girl? What's mousy brown hair? I never hear that used. There's a vocab bit. This was before all kids of all races and genders started appearing on milk cartons. Is this almond milk? Soy milk? <laughs> 73 kids. <laughs> we just right from the cow. We killed y'all. You know, Got the allergies right there. It was back when people believed. Wait, there's been a disenchanting of the populace since when? We're not negative, we're kids in your class. We're not disenchanted. Wow, that's one paragraph. One paragraph. And then think about it. Somebody's saying we need informational text. We can't read the lovely bones. No, 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 we don't have time for that fiction. How about reading informational text and spending five minutes on an article that talks about the importance of a name? This Icelandic girl, her name was too masculine Iceland as a nation took her to the superior court saying, you can't have that name. What? You I mean, I'm, I'm down with Iceland. I understand that 75% of their population can trace all the way back to the very first settlers of Iceland. It's that inbred, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just Iceland. It's hard to get to. <laughs> but poor Blair is like, I just want the name I've been given. You don't think a kid can be lit up by that article? And I am the article evangelist. I think this is the answer to informational text. I have articles about, and you probably saw it go to ESPN after it broke in the Wall Street Journal, which is where I first saw it. You saw the guys who played tag for 17 years? If you didn't see that story, I have it in the live binder for you. It's brilliant. A group of old men who, for one month a year, play tag around the country to the point where they bribe wives to get in trunks of each other's cars. This year, the guy who was it, because once you're it at the end of January, you're it for the rest of the year, he showed up at his buddy's dad's funeral, shakes his hand, says, you're it, and proceeds down the line. <laughs> Sorry for your loss. What kid doesn't love that story? And then you start talking about, okay, if you're going to intercept your buddy in Washington, D.C., and you're living in Montana, how long does it take you to fly there on a connecting flight? How much does it cost? Can you get to Expedia and do it for, uh, cheaper? Wow, now we start talking about it. Now we start talking about math. We're talking about science. Hey, why does it take me less time to fly east across the country than west against the jet stream? Oh, whoa! Wait, you're telling me that we can't do fiction? Do fiction all you want. Lovely Bones is a fantastic book. We have guys who are playing tag around the country, and this is important. I have an article in your live binder about a study that suggests that your yearbook picture in college is a determiner of your divorce chances. <laughs> you better smile, that's all I'm saying. You can find the article all you want, but you better have smiled in that picture. It's amazing. 
I have information about an NYU professor who embedded a camera in the back of his head as an art project. The article is loaded with questions about First Amendment rights. Hey, I'm sitting in the front row of this professor's class and he's literally got eyes in the back of a head. And not only that, it was loaded with political context because the guy was tied to, I believe, a museum in Yemen and he had also been part of a video game that was designed to take out President Bush in the video game. So you've got an NYU professor who's stimulating political topics, who's also in the art world, who's also a champion of free speech, and it's right around the corner from us. What can't you connect that to? That's almost everything you teach. We need to think as teachers about the types of things that light us up. Remember, that's what teaching used to be? I mean, really, back in the day, it used to, one-room schoolhouse, we're going to teach this because I like this book. And I think you're going to like it. And generally, that worked, right? It worked. Kids are like, yeah, I can tell the teacher really liked it, so I kind of gave it a chance. Right, what's that movie that, that's out now with the, everybody cries in the first 10 seconds of it? It's not up, but what, the, 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 about the cancer and all that stuff? I mean, yeah, thank you, yes, right. Who's not making room in their curriculum for that? I sit down with a table of seniors yesterday at lunch and they say, you know, we just need some more books that are high interest. And they all say, we'll read Macbeth, but can you give us a little bit of that to get us to Macbeth? Can you give us just a little bit? And if we're talking about cancer, can we do just a little bit of an article about cancer? Can we do an article about something that's tied to research? Hey, do an art, a local study article about the fact that, for example, my community just raised $82,000 in a Relay for Life. How much of that goes back to the American Cancer Society? I hate to rain on you, but they are among the worst for getting that actually to cancer research. So then you dovetail that with Lance Armstrong and his foundation, the fact that ne that never went to money. It was about raising cancer awareness. And you've got some good information, and it stimulates discussion. And I would say you could cap that discussion in your class to three minutes, done, move on, do it every day. You have hit informational text till you're blue in the face, and you haven't lost a single item. And in fact, your kids might walk out of your class going, wow, I kind of love English. I love reading. Did you love the lovely bonds? Well, yeah, that was fine too, but that article about the golfing thing, that was cool, you know? Again, all of this is in your live binders, too. How about an activity like this, uh, using that article? You could do this with almost anything, but this is what I did uh, practicing this with a college class I teach. What significance does your name have to you? There's very surface level. I'll talk about myself. Good, I'm good with that. Identify three conclusions you could draw about Icelandic society. Those kids had to know in the article. Wow, they're kind of conservative. They're a little patriarchal. She had to have a female name. That's kind of interesting. That discussion started getting really, really interesting. And then, you know what? Okay, I'll play the HESPA rule, write a letter. But this time, I need you to write a letter with evidence. Express to Blair that you're against the fact that the court said she could use the name ultimately. But you know what? I'm not going to grade all weekend. I'm not taking home a pile of paper. Six sentences, that's all I want. Ooh. Now you're teaching brevity. You're teaching choice of words. You might even be teaching syntax. You're certainly teaching finding evidence. You're talking about reading between the lines. And when it's all said and done, you have taught your children every common core skill that will give them 21st century college and career readiness. That is fabulous. That's one article. That can be from Us Weekly. That can be from the New York Times. That can be from the Wall Street Journal. It really doesn't matter. As a kid, it was BMX Plus, Thrasher, Sports Illustrated. That's it. And I became an English teacher. I don't have a problem with any of that stuff. And certainly, I thank Miss Casamano for shoving novels down my throat because I think I'm a better man because of it. Now, but what a different experience I would have had if someone was giving me access through things I could grab, things I could really understand quickly. Oh, by the way, was that article informational text? Ah, good. Okay. Remember, you're punching me out there. There's nothing you can take in your classroom. At the very core of this, the Common Core asks us to synthesize using evidence. Last year, my school, and it's in fact the whole district, took on an initiative. One SGO for the entire building, the entire district, was tied to developing students' ability to use text-based evidence. I find that to be at the very base of all of this. Can you read something, find something in there to use in an argument of your own? If you can do that, amen, brother, you've got it. It all flows from there. Readiness requires that we use evidence. What college class did you ever sit in where the professor said, uh, okay, so tell me what you thought about the book. It was good, and they just moved on. Can you explain? 
you know, go to, go to what uh, Tracy said, right? Explain how. Give me some of that. Evidence should drive our selection of texts, and we need to think about texts writ large. Texts are movies. Texts are pieces of art. Texts are the automobiles that have been designed over ages and ages differently for different reasons. That's a text. When I first found out that my 2004 Honda Accord was designed to mimic a crouching cheetah, I thought I had the fastest mobile ever. A Japanese engineer somewhere was going, I see crouching cheetah. Honda Accord, four cylinder. <laughs> you know, when I, have the, when I have the air conditioning on and I'm pulling onto the highway, I definitely feel that cheetah. <laughs> Especially when the escalates up my butt as I'm trying to get on, I'm just saying. It's a little bit challenging. Evidence feeds synthesis. You can't put things together unless you have things to assemble. And synthesis draws on lab findings, articles, Photographs, films, stop your teachers and say, if you want to teach language art skills, don't necessarily go to text as you knew it. Text writ large. Why is a painting, why does a painting make us sad? Why is a painting reflective of the Rococo era? Why is a flying buttress called a flying buttress? Let's look. Here's one I love to use with students. Again, it's in your live binder. I knew you couldn't see it. This is Lance Armstrong in our unheroic age. This is my favorite because when I went to find this article online, it was a completely different article and I learned a lot. In the paper, there was no subtitle that says, forget about athletes as role models. It would just be nice if there were more fathers in the house. In the paper, you're reading through and somewhere in the third column of the article, it starts making this shift over Lance Armstrong and the rest of these guys who are doing steroids have taken away role models. And since we don't have dads in the house, there aren't any role models. Wouldn't it be nice if we go back to the 1940s where we had people to live for, even if they were faking it for us? Online, they sell you out and give you that whole piece up top. Online, they had a picture, a 1950s dad standing with a son. It would have helped every kid. In the newspaper, none of that. They don't have money. They're trying to keep it as condensed as possible. What a great opportunity. Treatment of the same subject with the same words, dramatically different. What I learned from that was realizing how much a picture and a one-line descriptor could help my kids get access. My kids don't think, I mean, they know Lance Armstrong, but if I was to talk about, uh, I don't know, Marco Pantani or some other major cyclist who recently died, who runs around in spandex all the time, my kids couldn't care less. If I talk about Marco Pantani as the dad they didn't have, maybe they're in a little bit. If I talk about Marco Pantani, the drug user, now they're in a little bit more. This particular article, think about the information our kids would need to do it well. Who were your heroes growing up? Okay, they're in. That answer will depend on your age, but if you're male and over 50, I'm out of that. Okay. The type of men you most wanted to emulate seem to be quickly disappearing. In their place, we see a parade of diminished character. Okay, every ELL student in your classroom just thought a parade was like marching down the road with a band. That's what they have. Did you stop and think that's also developing vocabulary? And when you define parade, if it's necessary in your class, do you throw it up on a wall and reference it? And then use parade six different ways. We're a parade of characters going to the bathroom today. What are you guys? Did you just drink water before you came into class? What a parade. What a parade. Let's have a parade. Okay, parade magazine. I know we're tight on time, I won't go too deep in that, but this is, uh, article is up for you as well. But try asking these questions following an article like that, and I put in brackets so you could really substitute anything in. What type of writing is that? Can kids tell you it's an editorial? I have college students who struggle to tell me it's an editorial. They'll normally tell me it's an opinion piece, but there are keys. Like, it tells you at the very bottom, Jimmy, a professor at Vanderbilt, you know, has studied Lance Armstrong. Those little details are the beginning of where all of your teachers, all of you in different subject areas should start. Have you ever taught your student why reading a history textbook is different from reading a novel? I guarantee you, you have students who walk into a history class and are looking for theme, main character, rising action, exposition, oh sorry, exposition is the beginning, right? And a climax conclusion. And there's a little bit of that, the way war goes and the way we kind of overthrow people and stuff like that. Yeah, but it's done chronologically. And I know you, I think probably name probably 15 movies right now that didn't go chronologically. And you can think of 100 books that start with a flashback. How many history books do? Mm, not typically. How many people in a math class have taught why it's important to see 
the sample problem as the beginning of the explanation for what you're about to rehearse 20 times. Or in a science class that you read, go to the diagram, must under the, understand the diagram before you go back to the text. That's different. And no one who's a science teacher doesn't know how to do it. You wouldn't be a science teacher if you didn't have that skill mastered. But do we stop and inform our students? It sounds stupid, but that's instructing reading. So that slide that says, I'm no reading teacher, baloney. You just have to stop. What's the author's opinion of Lance? And show me the two lines where he makes that opinion. There's a reference to Great Gatsby in the longer version of the article, which is part of the reason I like it. Why throw in Gatsby? Oh, now you're going cross curricular on me, Smith. We were in a health class talking about steroids. Back off. Is there a larger argument at play? Well, the subtitle on the online version about it being about 1950s dads and role models kind of ruined that. But before that was there, it was very hard to determine for kids who are new readers. And where does the author identify an opposing point of view? That article is available for you too. Oh, and by the way, that article is informational text. Just throwing it out there. Steal this. If your kids have trouble doing what I just walked you through, here are four great ways to scaffold that activity. Just tell your students, present them with an article, give them five minutes to read it, and say, just circle the most important paragraph, the one that captures the main idea. Done, move on, do it seven times over the next three weeks. I guarantee your kids are better readers. If that's too hard, drop it down a little bit. Can you find the key sentence for me, the one that captures best, you think, the essence of this article? There are typically three or four. A kid might find a thesis statement. A kid also might find that somewhere near the conclusion is more powerful than that. Or a kid might find the sentence that I refer to as the big butt. You know, good professional writers are writing you, sucking you into an argument, and then they're like, but, yeah, now let me give you the real argument, suckers. If kids can identify the big butt. Try doing that in class. Their sight. How about giving your students an article, and I put a sample up in your live binder, with four different paragraphs circled, or four segments circled, and say, can you connect the information here? You don't even have to read the first three pages, the full three pages of the article. I'm dealing with ELL students, I'm dealing with my special needs students who need things a little bit clarified. Teach them how to get information from larger pieces. How about building your case? Why don't you give the students a thesis that you know is right? Hey, I could have given them that article about Blair who lost her name. And say, Blair should never be able to use a man's name. Go. Find the evidence in that article that says that or something else. Give your kids the thesis. How many of us do that? I'm telling you, we give writing assignments. We tell the kids to come back with three, five, two paragraphs, 18 paragraphs. You take them home. It takes you three weeks to grade them because it's such a pain in the neck and you really want to see your kid's Little League game or maybe put your feet up once. Watch the Rangers, Yankees. Well, none of them are worth it at this point, but you know what I'm saying. We don't. So let's go shorter, more frequent, and more meaningful and develop the skills. That's not to say we don't give them the scarlet letter. It's not to say we don't do a large essay. It's not to say there isn't a place for five paragraph writing, but if you really want to throw your kids a, a, you know, into a tizzy, ask them to do four paragraphs. That, whoa, how do I do a thesis with four paragraphs? You know, I mean, we all live it. Come on, it's true. All right. Oh, and by the way, wasn't that nonfiction? Oh, beautiful. All right. Before anything you assign your kids, think about what knowledge they need. If they don't know who Lance Armstrong is, I've lost that. If they don't have any concept of what a Leave it to Beaver kind of dad is, I've lost it. How would a good reader approach a passage? What does a good reader do? A good reader starts asking questions. Hmm, how long is this going to be? Where I'm looking for the shift, I'm looking for the butt, I'm also looking up words that I don't understand. What can you teach your students about how to read in your discipline area? What images could be shown beforehand? You'd be surprised. One picture on the board. Please read the article I gave you. I just have that picture on the board. Don't worry about it. Just read the article. What that can do to getting students to understand. And you're doing Common Core, which is pulling multiple sources of information together and having the students connect them. Hello. And we haven't lost a bit of fiction yet. Yeah. And then what vocabulary sources are, resources are there for your students? If you're teaching snapshot in a digital photography class, do you ever put that on the wall so that you can reference that and say, here, we got snapshot. We've got f-stop. You don't have to load film anymore, which is nice. Two math tests. This is New Park, right? Third grade Park. Look at part B, I know it's pretty far away. How many more packages did Mr. Conley deliver on Monday and Tuesday than he did on Thursday and Friday? If your kids don't know what how many more than means in third grade, they cannot do this problem. That is vocabulary. 
Are our math teachers just stopping and making sure students understand the book? And are they putting more than up there with the little alligator mouth next to it and also the explanation of what more than is with a couple examples, leave it on the wall and refer to it constantly? How about this one? This killed me. Look at the beast that is this question. An archaeological team is excavating artifacts from a sunken merchant. At this point, your ELL students are out. Five words, gone. Gone. Come on. Then they talk about a probe on the ocean floor. Has, maybe your physics students are going, probe. We used one of those with Dr. Summit. So, you know, we were doing that. That's cool. Okay. Some of your other students may watch something like uh, House, right? And they've used probes. So we're going to probe into that. We also are probing, you know, on the medical table. But look at this. Uh, let's see. The figure shows a representation of the team ship on the probe. Select the drop down menus. When the probe reaches the ocean floor, the probe will be approximately X. Drop down from the box below the surface when the probe reaches the horizontal distance behind. I mean, holy cow. So many words. Who's breaking down their math textbook? The word problems. It can be done. It can be done easily. It just takes time and a little attention. I'm flying because I know we're tight on time. You can look at this till your heart's content in the live binder and call me up and ask to talk. And by the way, our own park assessment was informational text. We didn't even lose any fiction. Okay, a couple more quick things. For my visual and performing arts people, one of the things that I've been touting for a long time is that there's a common language. When we analyze a painting, when we analyze a textbook, when we analyze a video, when we analyze a statue, it's all the same language. We look for predominantly these four things. If you look at those four sets of words, you probably know, yeah, when I'm reading something, we're picking up on that stuff too. Let me give you an example. Okay, we see this very famous painting. Based on the four things I put on the, and I don't know, four things is so weak, but uh, nobody worked on my vocabulary when I was a kid. Um, the key question is that, what colors are dominant here? How does the artist use light? What's the tone that the artist is projecting, and how did you get to that conclusion? What details led you to that? What's significant about the composition or its subject? How about the fact that he's sitting in a bathtub? Do you tell your kids that ahead of time? What does the context or do the context of the French Revolution and the fact that it's a neoclassical painting add to anything? Does that help your students get in? Your art teachers are doing common core literacy. Is there significance to the name on the box and the knife on the floor? There is. Are your music teachers doing that? Do they put up a piece of, or do they listen to a, a piece of abstract 1950s or beginning of 60s John Coltrane, atonal saxophone, drive you to oblivion, 26 minute, one CD piece where he's trying to rage against the fact that the civil rights movement hasn't taken hold and he as a black man is getting killed? Is anybody talking about that? And then connecting it to hip hop music that emerged at the end of the 20th century? That's all it takes. They didn't lose an ounce of their subject matter. But they can't just say, this is what it is and this is what it is. It's let's play it. What do you think? What tone colors are you hearing? Why does this make you go, ah, turn it off? Why does it make you say, what's that screeching? He got paid for that? Because that's what kids love, right? And that's a text. Excerpt from Jay Gatsby, right? From Gatsby. Details, composition, context, color, tone. Again, you have this for you elsewhere, but the amount they hype this guy and his material wealth, because you know, if you've read the book, he's setting you up, Fitzgerald's setting you up to take this guy off his throne, but he's setting you up. Are the kids hip to that? Do they understand? It was rich cream color, bright with nickel, swollen here and there in its monstrous length, triumphant, monstrous, swollen. Those are strong words, but they also have that little edge to them. Triumphant normally means, and whap, it's coming right when you're not expecting it. Swollen, never good. I don't go to the doctor for unswollen things. Just throwing that out there. All right. We have a common language across areas. Consider what's happening in the text, why the author is positioning something there, what he's attempting to convey, or she. How are the details advancing the argument? Why tell me this now? What are you trying to get me to believe? And if you've ever been that person who said, how do people buy into that advertisement? This is the beginning of how we solve that. Because we teach our kids to be critical thinkers. And I'll tell you right now, our kids are so visually literate right now, they are very, very good at seeing when people are pulling the, eyes, or pulling the wool over their eyes. However, they are now moving into the generation that provides the advertisements that are ripe to fool them again. 
Look at where the author fits into the context. If I know Hemingway's a late realist, perhaps even early modernist writer, that tells me a lot about what he's trying to say. We have to make sure kids see things in those contexts if we're going common core. Almost there. Easy ways to compare and contrast the same subject matter. Political cartoons are a home run. Here are three that perhaps make fun of the Republican pers uh, view of Obamacare, and here are three that perhaps, sorry, trying to keep equal time, that make fun of Obama. Great, let your kids go nuts. But ask them pointed questions. They're comparing six, in this case, six treatments of the same subject. And believe me, I could have had 100,000 based on what Google gave me. Again, I'm flying through this, we're almost there. Have you ever taken four movie posters for the same movie that was redone over and over again and asked your kids what they're trying to convey? This is a great cross-content exercise. That Hamlet with Mel Gibson couldn't be more different from our Kenneth Branagh version in the middle at the top. I'm seeing a lot of subterfuge and danger in the upper left, and I don't get that at all in the Branagh version. And anybody who's seen that like six-hour monstrosity knows you're celebrating at the end and it's over. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's awfully long. It's awfully long. Okay. Oh, wait, wrong way. Ha. And by the way, those were all texts. Steal this idea! Use YouTube clips, but ask your kids when they accompany a project or a statement or a paragraph or three paragraphs or a page to put a YouTube clip attached to it, but have them explain why the YouTube clip, YouTube clip complements, broadens, exemplifies, whatever. Press them on it. Ask them to tie a song to something they've written. This is old news. This stuff isn't new. All you have to do is ask them how. Take an item from your house and bring it in on Monday and tell me how it connects to Wuthering Heights. Be ready for it. That's common core, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Bible that was being thumped, you know, when Heathcliff was missing Catherine. Beautiful. Steal that idea. That's why I shook that triangle, by the way. Just steal it. Or, or punch me when we get in the lobby, which is happening soon. Oh, by the way, not that this is, uh, and that was a text too, yes, the flower, sorry, the vegetable gun. If you ever had a student who was doing something like the things they carried or going after Cacciato, who brought in that, when you've got Tim O'Brien talking about the horrors of war, but also there's a certain element of beauty in the, in the manipulation of truth, and that little rose that's coming out of the end of a gun that's made not to look so scary might be that hint of truth, and that kid could articulate that to you? Holy cow! Put that kid in college now. But are we asking them to do that? I'm afraid we're stepping back and saying we can't go there. It's too much. We have to do what Common Core is asking us, and I think we've missed it. We need to stretch rather than confine. And a lot of these stretchings are exactly what you've already been doing. Yes, okay, we got the fireworks. Thank you. Almost there. Steal this. You could do a research paper. A te replace a 10-page research paper with that kid describing that rose. They've done the exact same thing, that rose gum. Is it a dramatic shift? You know, if you read Ed Week, they'll put some stuff in there every once in a while that says it's a dramatic shift. Common Core is dramatic shift. We're no longer doing money. It's out at first grade, that's it. I'm telling you, man, my kid spends more money on gems in... Uh, what is it? That stupid game, Clan, Clan War or whatever it is? I don't know, I'm sure if you've got like a fourth grader, it's there. Literacy drives every skill area and your teachers know how to do it. Just give them confidence and freedom. For those of your educational leaders, if you're a classroom teacher, go back and evangelize, please. I believe there's more creativity afforded to teachers and we're giving students portable skills that they walk away with. And I think, this is Smith, if you come to the Monmouth Literacy Symposium in the fall, my argument will be that articles are the single best way for us to enrich our kids' education. I think there's so much there for us. Every subject area can find an article because the common core is meant to enrich us and inspire us and not make us afraid. I thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day. I hope this is productive.